Hey, and welcome to John chapters 15 and 16 today. Uh, we're going to be focusing in on and continuing our discussion of some of the things that Jesus had to say to his disciples um, towards the very, very end of his life. So this is in the last week where Jesus is um, walking with the disciples, and um, and he's been walking with them now for a couple of years. And so um, they've built this relationship, and he knows them very, very well. And so Judas has gone off to do his thing and, and betray his Lord and Savior. And, and so um, I would hope that as we, I guess it wasn't his Savior, uh, but that's a very... Uh, sad and, and kind of depressing thought. Um, but I think it's important that we kind of take a little view of where we came from. So we've come out of the rest of the book of John and we, we've spent a lot of time looking at his at Jesus' teaching and his miracles that backed up those teachings. And so uh, we've gone all the way from John 1 where we've seen Jesus as God the Son. And now we're really wrapping all the way back around to that same idea. We're seeing some really, really deep um, John theology here in the next in the last couple of chapters. In these two chapters, we're going to go over today, and then also in chapter 17, which we'll cover next week. And so, um, I wanted to make a note too. If you're ever looking for the playlist uh, for this, you can actually see that up in the corner of this video. And what that's going to do is it looks like a little letter I icon. Um, if you're on mobile, you'll have to go into the little three dots and um, click through there, and it'll say more from or something like that. And, um, and if you click on that, you'll notice that there's a little button that brings you immediately to the whole playlist. And so that way you can see all the videos uh, straight off the bat. And if you're watching this after all the videos have come out, that's where you can access all of these. They'll be public. You can go on there, um, leave your comments as questions if you have anything that you want to ask. And hopefully um, we can reach back out to you uh, no matter when you comment that. So uh, we get notifications on that. So just let us know. Um, and so as we launch into John 15, as usual, I try to add a little visual for you guys. And so today I noticed that uh, we're talking about Jesus is the true vine. And so I looked up what a grapevine would look like. And, and this is a grapevine being um, pruned. And so I thought this was appropriate. So we're talking about um, both the vine and the branches and the, the vine dresser. And so uh, this will be a good image for us to keep in mind. Um, always wear gloves when working with sharp cutting implements. So um, just a little fun for you guys today. In John chapter 15, uh, kind of our main idea is that Jesus is the true vine. God is the vine dresser and Christians are the branches. And so Jesus builds this little analogy for us to be able to see and for us to be able to look through. Sorry, I lost my stand there for a second. For us to be able to look at um, and, and see ourselves in and see our position uh, before God. Um, some context for this, Jesus is continuing to speak to his disciples as we just talked about um, in this time leading up to his death and his resurrection. Um, and it's likely from the context of the last verse of chapter 14 uh, that Jesus and the disciples were walking to the garden where he will be betrayed. So these are important things to notice because this is starting to, to flavor the conversation. Um, they're getting closer and closer to the end, and Jesus is laying out all of this truth and promising the disciples a couple of key things. And so this is noticeable for us. Uh, these chapters are specifically meant to be heard uh, by the disciples and by us as believers to follow. And this is important because he's speaking to these disciples in private. This is the very end of his life. He's not pre preaching really out into the world, but he's teaching his disciples. And Jesus reveals some amazing truths in these chapters that we're going to dig into today. The first one that, I'll, that we'll notice is from chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. We'll read that as usual. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every dr branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. 
If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. So as we're reading through these verses, we first of all grab the idea that Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. God is the vine dresser who prunes those branches, and we will talk about that a little bit more. For this section, we're actually going to go through a couple of key verses. Um, for the rest of it, we'll go through some key ideas. But I think it's important to dig into a couple of these since there's a lot of language that's small words t packed tightly together. And those are difficult for our brains sometimes to comprehend. And so what we're going to do instead today is go through a couple of those, uh, those chains and talk about them a little bit more. So in verse 4, it says, Abide in me and I in you. And then it goes on to talk about the branches that cannot bear fruit unless they are connected to the vine. Branches that are not connected will wither and die and in the course of their life will be burnt up. And so notice the connection here that we're all branches. It's just how is that connected? Are we connected to the vine? Have we been brought into this, this connection, this, this living relationship with the vine and we produce fruit or are we disconnected? Are we not connected to the vine, trying to do it on our own? That is the story of humanity, is that we are all these branches, but only some of us are connected because we've rebelled and, and broken off those connections to the vine. We've tried to be independent at the cost of our own lives. And so I want us to notice kind of what's going on right off the bat here, because we're going to see that later on as well. In verse 7, he says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So what does this verse tell us about prayer? Seemingly, it's, it's saying that it's like, oh, you can ask whatever you want. But, but again, we've, we've learned now in John, if you've watched our previous videos, how important it is to read this verse in the context of good biblical prayer. What has Jesus been saying throughout the last couple chapters about prayer? And you can also go and see Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 15. That is the Lord's Prayer. We've talked about that before here in this class. But it's important to notice because Matthew 6, 5 through 15 talks about what we ought to pray for and how we ought to pray. And it begins that we should pray that, that God's will be done. And I believe that if we pray for something in the will of God, it will always come to pass. And so I want us to recognize that that's going on here. It's not just saying blanket statement, whatever you say will happen. That's manifestation. We don't want to believe in that. But instead, we want to recognize that, that there is power in prayer, especially in prayer that, that conforms to what God is doing in the world. As we go into verse 8, another thing that I think trips us up sometimes is this verse, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Sometimes we take this to mean that our works make us disciples, and that's simply not the case. The proof of salvation is found in works. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that salvation is found in works. It says the proof, the evidence is found in works. Salvation is evidenced by works, but it's accomplished by grace through faith. Notice the difference there. Accomplished means that Jesus has already accomplished our salvation by grace. But we, our, our salvation is made obvious to us and to others through the proofs of works. Notice in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. This is, Ephesians is a small book, and my Bible does not want to turn there sometimes. But in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, it says, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. So notice what's happening there. That's all passive language. God is doing the saving. But our proof of salvation is found in those works which he gives. And we later read that he gives even those works to us. And so notice that that's happening here as well. And then in verses 9 through 11, to kind of cap off that section of, 
um, of the chapter. Um, it's noticing that obedience is extremely important to God, and it should bring us joy to obey him. Those are two seemingly separate concepts that I think we need to understand really well, that, that obedience is important to God. We need to follow what he says. But those commandments should bring joy. Those commandments will inevitably bring happiness and joy and contentment into your life. He knows what you need, and he has built you to follow after him. Moving into verses 12 through 17, we see a little bit of a break here in which we begin to see how Jesus relates to us. He says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants. For the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask in the Father, you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. Notice what's going on here. As friends of Jesus, this means that we should naturally work harder for him. Again, speaking of that fruit of the vine. We should work harder for him as if working for someone that we love. I hope that in your life you've had the opportunity to work with or for someone that you're close to. It's a great experience, hopefully, in your life as it has been a little bit in mine. It's important to notice that when we work for somebody that we love, we go help a friend out or, or do something kind for someone that, that we're really close to. We usually do that happily, but then you go to your job and sometimes it's a drag. So I want us to notice what's going on here, that, that we, we notice and we're friends of God. And so being friends, we, we recognize that we work harder in that way. It also notices that no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But we know what God is doing because Jesus has revealed that truth to us. Um, and towards the end of this, we get these two verses that throw our brains off all the time uh, in verses 16 and 17. And the question is, who chose who? And I believe that the truth of that question, if we answer it honestly, should humble us um, and not cause us to be puffed up. That God chooses his people uh, should cause us to be humble and kind and generous, knowing that we are wretched sinners um, regardless. Um, but he has chosen to give grace, to bring grace into this world. And that is an amazing promise. As we move into verses 18 through 25, which will be almost to the end, uh, we begin to read a little bit about what Jesus expects uh, for the Christian life. He says, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would, not love, would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates my father hates, whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. So is the Christian life supposed to be easy? No. The world is going to hate you for good reason. Because they hated Christ first. So recognize that if you're ever hated by the world, if you're ever persecuted by the world, it is the natural state of being a Christian in a fallen world. The world hates Christians, little Christ, that's what that word means, because it first hated Christ himself. So I want you guys to notice that and be encouraged in it. And then in the last two verses, it says, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. The Holy Spirit exists in eternal relationship with the Father 
and the Son. That's what that word proceeds means. And we'll read much more about him, about the Holy Spirit, in our next lecture in John chapter 16. And so if you haven't watched that video, go check that one out right after this and click over into that video.